Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our daily devotions on this Wednesday morning with Pastor Sutton. Glad to have you here with us on this Wednesday, December 21st. It is the first day of winter, believe it or not. Um, and we're going to find that out with a fury starting tonight. Today is the shortest day of the year where I live. The uh, Sunlight is going to be 8 hours and 41 minutes. I was looking at this this morning just for fun. No, 8 hours and 42 minutes here. Harshaw, which is only a half hour north, 8 hours and 41 minutes. Uh, and down by La Crosse, Westby area, 8 hours and 43 minutes. But tomorrow, tomorrow will be a minute longer for sunshine. For sunshine. The day is still 24 hours. I don't care what anybody in Washington says or how you adjust your clock. So, winter officially starts today. I know it, it seems like it's been here already, but uh, today today's the day, the solstice. So, at 3.47 p.m. Central Time, uh, as when the sun reaches, well, the sun doesn't move, it's, it's our planet. But when our planet is at its furthest tilt away from the sun uh, in the northern hemisphere, we'll be at 3.47 p.m. Or p.m. This, af this afternoon, Central Time. That was probably more than you guys wanted to know, but there's your science class for today. I was just looking at the storm that's coming, too. It's going to, they're saying it's going to undergo bombogenesis, which I just wanted to be able to say, so I've said it. Bombogenesis, that is the, the storm will uh, have a uncustomary strengthening um, in the middle, dropping, uh, the, the low pressure dropping uh, 0.7 inches or 24 millibars uh, in a period of less than 24 hours. It's called, sometimes they're called a, 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 a bomb cyclone, I guess, is what the weather industry calls it. So it's kind of like the storm will be here and then it'll boom, and it really, really let loose. So, um, and that sounds like that's going to start um, tonight and go through Friday. Friday. Um, I don't know what it's going to do to worship things, worship services and things like that. We'll just have to play it by ear. Right now, I'm planning on everything as normal here on Wednesday, but because nothing's the, the snow is supposed to start a little bit around uh, two, two or three o'clock this afternoon, and then build toward evening. Uh, and because of this bombogenesis thing, the winds behind it, um, 40 mile an hour sustained winds at the back of the storm. Uh, with with gusts of 70 or even 80 miles an hour, according to the meteorologist. So it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. So winter, it's here. It's here. Just in time for uh, Christmas. Makes me think of the Christmas of 2013 uh, going into the new year, uh, where the temperatures plummeted even down in Fort Wayne, and we were at 14 below uh, for several days um, and got feet of snow, which in, in Fort Wayne is significant. Um, they don't know how to move snow around down there. They think they think the belly plow on a on a dump truck is sufficient. So anyway, good morning. Glad you're here with us on this Wednesday. We're doing that little different thing again where we're going to have a, a reading and then uh, one of Luther's uh, messages, one of his homilies from this Christmas book, Martin Luther's Christmas book, edited by Roland H. Bainton. Uh, so we're kind of doing that again today. Today, the Nativity of Christ. So uh, a little early, but, you know, I, I was going to go through each of these sermons uh, today. We, we went through the Ascension and the, uh, or the Annunciation and the and the Visitation. Um, today, today, the Nativity. Tomorrow, the Shepherds. And then Herod and the Wise Men, the Presentation. Um, all these things are covered in this little this little book. So let's let's go ahead and get into this. Let's see who's here this morning. Um, numbers look a little lower today, but Wednesday usually is. Glenn, good morning to you. You were the first one in this morning as I was getting started a little bit late. Uh, Kathy, good morning. Geraldine and Neil, good morning. Michael, good morning to you and Karen. Temperatures in the low 30s. Okay, and that's everybody who I have seen that's chimed in. I just refreshed my page to see if there was anyone I was missing. But to those watching the background, good morning. Hello, those watching later. Hi there. I forgot to start recording again, so I'm going to have to go back and 
and uh, edit this down to a shorter piece. But all right, well, let's uh, so let's go on. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, as we have here the last uh, since Monday, the last few days. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. A reading from Luke chapter two, verses one through seven. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them at the end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll go to this little thing from Luther here, Nativity. First, I'm going to, All right. The birth of Christ took place exactly when the Emperor Augustus sent out a decree that all the world should be taxed. This was no accident. The birth of Christ was timed to coincide with a census because God wanted to, wanted to teach us the duty of obedience even to a heathen government. He had been born, had he been born prior to the census, it might have appeared that he was unwilling to be subject to the Roman Empire. At the very first moment of his life, Christ and his parents had had to give evidence of obedience, not to God, but to the heathen emperor, the enemy of the Jews. This is the strongest proof that Christ's kingdom is to be distinguished from that of the world. Christ did not wish to erect a kingdom like an earthly king, but wished to be subject to a heathen government. Is not this shameful? That Christ should obey a power that his people and his household regarded as an abomination. But Christ obeyed the civil government of the emperor. Every Christian, therefore, should let Augustus administer his realm. And should not hinder, but help. But you say government is not good. Since Christ did not wish to be king, it is not good to govern. If it were, he would have accepted the proffered crown. If you are going to proceed on that premise you will be a fine saint. If you wish to do just as Christ did, you will have to be born of a virgin, raise the dead, walk on water, take no wife, have no gold, nor any manservant or maidservant. You might as well say nobody can be Christian who has a wife and a household, who is a peasant or a tailor, because Christ had no wife, no trade, nor any place where to lay his head. Piffle! to such confounded nonsense. Christ was a preacher. That is why he declined civil government. I am a preacher too and decline it also. But I do not condemn civil government as wrong. It is wrong for me because I am not called to it. I might as well say that no one should be a householder for, it is, for he is not a householder, a prince, a king, an emperor, and a bishop over servants, maids, and children. Very well, say our radicals, leave wife and child because they do involve government. But how are you going to have a higher power if you, if you do not have a lower? How can you have a town councilor without townsmen? But many townsmen make a city, and many cities make a principality, and so on up to a kingdom and an empire. Although Christ was no civil ruler, he did not forbid civil rule. Do not take everything that Christ did as an example. In that case, you might say to me, Dr. Martin won't be a burgomaster, a judge, or a hand worker, so these are not Christian professions. If I had to do them all, they would break my back. But you are not to, do, look, not, you are not to look at what Christ did or what I do. God gives to each his own task. You might as well say, my wife wears a veil and she is a Christian, so I must wear a veil and be a Christian. Nonsense. But Christ remains a preacher, Augustus an emperor, and the shepherds remain shepherds. The law of the census required that each householder must be present in his home at the time of the enrollment. 
Joseph was the lineage of David and had to go to Bethlehem, the city of David. Despite his royal ancestry, he was poor that he had been unable to make a living in Judea and for that reason had transferred to Nazareth. Now he had to go back to now he had to go back. Scripture says that he took with him Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. She would have had a good reason to excuse herself from making a journey so close to her time, but she said nothing because she wished to trouble no one. We can see how poor Joseph must have been, that he could not to afford to hire some old woman or neighbor to stay with Mary and to look after her while he was gone. How unobtrusively and simple do those events take place on earth that are so heralded in heaven. On earth it happened in this wise. There was a poor young wife, Mary of Nazareth, among the meanest dwellers of the town, so little esteemed that none noticed the great wonder she carried. She was silent, did not vaunt herself, but served her husband. She had no man or maid. They simply left the house. Perhaps they had a donkey for Mary to ride upon, though the Gospels say nothing about it, and may well, we may well believe that she went on foot. Think how she was treated in the, in, in the inns on the way. She who might well have been taken in a golden carriage with gorgeous equipage. How many great ladies and their daughters there were at that time living in luxury? Well, the mother of God on foot in midwinter trudged her weight across the fields. How unequal it was. The journey was certainly more than a day from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem, which lies on the farther side of Jerusalem. Joseph had thought, when we get to Bethlehem, we shall be among relatives and we can borrow everything. A fine idea that was. Bad enough that the young bride, married only a year, could not have had her baby at Nazareth in her own house instead of making all that journey of three days heavy with child. The inn was full. No one would release a room to this pregnant woman. She had to go to a cow stall and there bring forth the maker of all creatures because nobody would give way. And it was, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. When now they were come to Bethlehem, the evangelist says that they were, of all, the lowest and the most despised, and must make way for everyone until they were shoved into a stable to make a common lodging and table with the cattle. Well, many cutthroats lounged like lords in the inn. They did not recognize what God was doing in that stable. With all their eating and drinking and finery, God left them empty, and his comfort and treasure was hidden from them. Oh, what a dark night it was in Bethlehem, that this light should not have been seen. Thus shows God that he has no regard for what the world is and has and does. And the world shows that it does not know or consider what God is and has and does. Joseph had to do his best, and it may well be that he asked some maid to fetch water or something else, but we do not read that anyone came to help. They heard that young wife was lying in a cow stall and no one gave heed. Shame on you, wretched Bethlehem. The inn ought to have burned with brimstone, for even though Mary had been a beggar maid or unwed, anybody at such time should have been glad to give her a hand. There are many of you in this congregation who think to yourselves, if only I had been there, how quick I would have been to help the baby. I would have washed his linen. How happy I would have been to go with the shepherds to see the Lord lying in the manger. Yes, you would. You say that because you know how great Christ is. But if you had been there at that time, you would have done no better than the people of Bethlehem. Childish and silly thoughts are these. Why don't you do it now? You have Christ in your neighbor. You ought to serve him for what you do to your neighbor in need, you do to the Lord himself. The birth was still more pitiable. No one regarded this young wife bringing forth her firstborn. 
No one took her condition to heart. No one noticed that in a strange place she had not the very least thing needful in childbirth. There she was without preparation, no light, no fire. In the dead of night, in the thick darkness, no one came to give the customary assistance. The guests swarming in the inn were carousing and no one attended to this woman. I think myself, if Joseph and Mary had realized her time was so close, she might perhaps have been left in Nazareth. And now think what she could use for swaddling cloth. Some garment which she could spare, perhaps her veil. Certainly not Joseph's breeches, which are now in exhibition at Achaean. She wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger. Why not in a cradle, in a bench, or on the ground? Because they had no cradle, bench, table, board, or anything, whatever, except the manger of the oxen. This was the first throne of this king. There in a stable without man or maiden lay the creator of the world, and there was the maid of fifteen years, bringing forth her firstborn without water, fire, light, or pan, a sight for tears. What Mary and Joseph did next, nobody knows. The scholars say they adored. They must have marveled at this child who was the son of God. He was also a real human being. Those who say that Mary was not a real mother lose all joy. He was a true baby with flesh, blood, hands, and legs. He slept, cried, and did everything else that a baby does, only without sin. Think, women, there was no one there to bathe the baby. No warm water, nor even cold, no fire, no light. The mother was herself midwife and maid. The cold manger was the bed and the bathtub. Who showed the poor girl what to do? She had never had a baby before. I am amazed that the little one did not freeze. Do not make a, of Mary a stone. It must have been, it must have gone straight to her heart that she was so abandoned, that she was flesh and blood and must have felt miserable too, and Joseph also, that she was left in this way, all alone, with no one to help, in a strange land, in the middle of a in the middle of winter. Her eyes were moist, even though she was happy and aware that the baby was God's son and the savior of the world. She was not stone. For the higher people are in favor of God, the more tender they are. Mary was not only holy. She was also the mother of the Lord. With trembling and reverence, before nestling him to herself, she laid him down because her faith said to her, he will be the son of the highest. No one else on earth had this faith, not even Joseph, for although he had been informed by the angel, the word did not go to his heart as to the heart of Mary, his mother. Let us then meditate upon the nativity, just as we see it happening in our own babies. I would not have you contemplate the deity of Christ, the majesty of Christ, but rather his flesh. Look upon the baby Jesus. Divinity may terrify man. Inexpressible majesty will crush him. That is why Christ took on our humanity, save for sin, that he should not terrify us, but rather that with love and favor he should console and confirm. Behold Christ lying in the lap of his mother, still a virgin. What can be sweeter than the babe? What more lovely than the mother? What fairer than her youth? What more gracious than her, than her maidenship? Look at the child knowing nothing, yet all that is belongs to him, that your conscience should not fear, but take comfort in him. Doubt nothing. Watch him springing in the lap of the maiden. Laugh with him. Look upon the, this Lord of peace, and your spirit will be at peace. See how God invites you in many ways. He places before you a babe with whom you may take refuge. You cannot fear him, for nothing is more appealing to man than a babe. Are you frightened? Then come to him lying in the lap of the fairest and sweetest maid. You will see how great is the divine goodness which seeks above all else that you should not despair. Trust him. Trust him. Here is the child in whom is salvation. To me, there is no greater consolation given to mankind than this, that Christ became man, 
a child, a babe, playing in the lap and at the breast of the most gracious mother. Who is there whom this sight would not comfort? Now is overcome the power of sin, death, hell, conscience, and guilt. If you come to judge this gurgling babe and believe that he is come, not to judge you, but to save. Martin Luther. Let us continue with the Apostles' Creed, or with the, uh, no, with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On this Wednesday morning, we pray. O oh Lord, I lift up my heart to you in this morning hour. Sincerely grateful for the opportunities of another day. Bless me so all that I do may be acceptable to you. Grant me such success in my work as you know to be best for me. Keep me always mindful that all depends on my possessing your abundant grace and blessing. Help me, I pray, to reflect the infinite love with which you love me in Christ, my Savior. In all my dealings with others, help me to love them as I love myself and do, do for them uh, what I would have them do for me. Make me strong to resist any temptation to what does not rightfully belong to me. Give me the courage to suffer losses rather than to inflict them on others. Help me to realize that life consists not in the abundance of things I possess, but rather in what I do with what I possess, whether much or little. Teach me to know that godliness and contentment is a great gain and to live accordingly. In Jesus' name I pray, and in his name I begin the tasks of this day. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly... Oh, uh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are suffering in this world and at this time. We give thanks for your graciousness to those who have need. We pray especially for uh, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ at St. Mark's Ferndale and for their entire community as they recover from the earthquake. Uh, be with those as this storm approaches who live in this Midwest region. Um, grant that even if power should be lost, that they would be uh, safe, looking confidently to you in this season of your dear, dear of our dear Savior's birth. Be with those who've asked for our prayers, especially Pat, Lois, Anne, Brianne, Rose, Bob, Mike, Megan, Ezra, and all those who call upon your most holy name. Grant them healing where it is needed and assurance and comfort where all, all else has failed. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you've kept me this night from all harm and danger. I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, my friends, that brings our devotions to a close for this Wednesday morning. God's peace be with you. We'll be back here, blizzard or not, we'll be back here Thursday, tomorrow morning, uh, to spend a little time in God's Word and share another little message from Luther for this week of the nat nativity. God's peace be with you. Thank you.